Everybody knows what happened on January 6th of this year. I happened to be home that day and I watched it live on TV. On that day, a mob of protesters stormed the Capitol building in an attempt to overturn the election. There was violence, looting, death, and destruction. Our congressional leaders were in great danger that day. It was bizarre, it was unprecedented, and it was deemed an insurrection. I couldn't believe my eyes as I watched. It was very, very wrong, very, very bad. A horrible day in the history of our country. But I gotta tell you, the thing that horrified me most about the images that I was seeing were the crosses and other symbols of the Christian faith being flown in the midst of that mob. I witnessed pictures of Jesus and de declarations that Jesus saves and rioters carrying Bibles in the midst of that great and horrible day. I was greatly saddened by the sight. I was saddened because a watching world would now connect Christianity with this mayhem. The world would lose respect for our faith and the reputation of the church would be further tarnished in the eyes of the world. This was, however, only one episode in this theme. Sadly, the reputation of the church has taken many hits over the years. In, in previous years, we've had Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker scandals that rocked the, the country. We've had hypocritical preachers caught in adultery or in thievery. We've had rogue church leaders scamming congregants in investment schemes. We've seen Westboro Baptist Church spewing hate at big events. Going back further, we've had the Crusades. We've had other holy wars. We've had Christians behaving badly. Over time, the Christian witness, witness has been damaged by these kind of occurrences. The Christian faith after these kind of events is now just a little less likely to be embraced by people who really need Jesus. Today, secular movies portray Christians often as naive or weak or bigoted. I hate the way that movies portray preachers. Preachers on TV are usually either weak, wimpy milk toast, or they are scheming evil sex offenders. I don't want to be like any of the preachers I see on TV. But that's the way culture sells us. In 2007, Dave Kinnaman wrote a book called Unchristian. It was based on Gallup polling. And the conclusion that he reached was that the general population of America sees Christians in mostly negative terms. The average American sees a Christian as hypocritical, judgmental, sheltered, anti-gay, and overly political. These criticisms and perceptions are sometimes merited, and sometimes they're not. But no matter what, no matter whether they're merited or not, this is the backdrop of how we Christians must now engage with the world. This is the image that we operate with. And it might not always be fair, and it might not apply to us personally, but this is the challenge we have when we engage with the culture. The culture sees us in this way. Now, back in ancient times, in the times that Peter wrote to the early Christians, they were experiencing similar challenges. Christians back then often got a bad rap that they didn't deserve. They got a bad rap and were held in low esteem by the general population. Christians were foreigners, they were outsiders, and they were different than their contemporaries. This difference uh, created considerable nastiness. Christians were scorned and stigmatized and slandered by their neighbors. The Roman writer uh, Suetonius said that Christianity is just a mischievous superstition. It's not to be taken seriously. Because Christians would not, would not worship multiple gods, they were deemed atheist by some people. Because Christians refused to worship the local city gods, 
they were called disloyal to their region. Christians had fellowship dinners called love feasts. Their neighbors misunderstood and thought they were orgies. Christians called each other brother and sister. What's that all about, the neighbors thought. And Christians were, would eat Jesus' flesh and drink his blood in communion and were thought to be some kind of cannibals. Christians in the early church were misunderstood and mocked and scorned for their differences. They, too, had some big disadvantages relating to the culture and trying to influence the, the culture with the gospel. And they must have asked, what's a Christian to do? How are we to navigate such a hostile culture? How are we supposed to win the world for Christ when people mistrust us and misunderstand us so dramatically? Well, here's what Peter advises them to do in 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Peter says this, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. What Peter was saying is that the world might not understand you, the world might not like you, the world may completely misrepresent you, and you can't control that. But here's what you can control. He says, live an awesome life. Live a holy life. Live a pure and loving and spotless life. Live a life that shines bright in the darkness. Let them see that life. Let them see your good deeds. Peter wants us to live shockingly compassionate lives. He wants us to live radically selfless lives. He wants us to live amazingly humble lives. He's saying, get their attention by living lives like no one else, better than no one else. They will then see your never-ending good deeds, and it will take their breath away. They will see it and be awed by it. Now, Jesus said something very similar in Matthew 5, 16. The words of Jesus. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Again, Jesus is saying, just like Peter, do lots of good deeds. Be a person known by your good deeds. Let the world see your good deeds. Paul said a similar thing in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. He says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Friends, the eyes of the world are on you. The people you meet are daily sizing you up as a Christian. Every move you make, every step you take, they're watching you. So let them see you as a person of glorious good deeds. Paul, again, said a similar thing in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 to 12. He said, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life might win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Friends, you can't influence the world for Jesus if the world doesn't respect you. And the quality of your character can earn that respect. So let them see your good deeds. Finally, in Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, 7, Paul spells out the qualifications for leaders in the church. Essentially, he's saying, if, if you want to be on the leadership team, if you want to be hired on the staff, if you want to head up a ministry or lead a small group, you must have a good reputation with outsiders. 
so that you will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Friends, our behavior, the way we treat each other, the integrity of our lives, and the love we display to everyone will always be the key to gaining respect and engaging the world around us in positive ways. It's our good deeds that will get their attention. Let me illustrate that with something that happened just a couple weeks ago. On Super Bowl Sunday, I was home watching the game. It was a terrible game, a boring game. By the third quarter, you knew who was going to win. There wasn't much drama or excitement. At our house, it was late in the third quarter. There wasn't much drama. Um, it, the score was going to be pretty predictable. I was sitting there listening to all the Brady love, and I was losing interest in the biggest game of the year. But then something happened that caught my attention. A fan ran out on the field. He raced by all the players, and he started heading for the end zone. He started at the 50-yard line, and the guards were chasing him. He faked one of them out. He broke a tackle, and he was headed for the end zone. He got to the 40, to the 30, to the 20, to the 10, and finally a security guard tackled him on the one-yard line. He never did score. Now, I got to admit to you, I didn't actually see him do that live because the cameras cut away and wouldn't show it. That's their policy. I just saw the very beginning of that whole thing, but YouTube captured it, so I was able to see it after the fact. I just had to watch what happened. Here's my point today. In the middle of a boring game, this woke me up and got my attention. Now, I don't know who this guy was. Um, I mean, my brother lives in Tampa, and I don't think it was him. Um, it was obviously some fool who was probably banned from football for the rest of his life. He looked like an idiot, but he got my attention. He did something different. Peter was saying, if you want to get the world's attention, if you want to grab their attention, live a life full of love and care and good deeds. He says, you need to shock them with the different life, the good life you're living. Turn the other cheek, love your enemies, pray for your persecutors, stand up for the downtrodden, care for the poor, love your neighbors as you love yourself, be humble, Take care of the needs of others. Be kind, be caring, be generous, be interested, be encouraging, be a listener, be a helper. Live and love like no one else lives and loves. Peter would say, be shockingly helpful. Be radically kind, be surprisingly humble. Live the kind of life that people notice, that they sit up and take note. Live the kind of life that people are impressed with so that people will want to know where did that come from and what does that guy have and how can I find that kind of a life. Get their attention by your good deeds. I want to ask you today, what would it look like in your life if you were the kindest person in your office? If you are the most encouraging person in your whole school, if you are the most loving neighbor on your block, how many lives could you change if that were the case? How many conversations would that generate? How many misconceptions of Christianity could you break down by living that kind of life? You don't need to be brilliant. You don't need to be gifted. You don't need to be especially brave. But what you do need is to be loving and caring and a person of good deeds. Peter says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. And if Peter's not good enough, Jesus himself says the same thing. 
Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Okay, we made our point today. Now, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to get started? I made some suggestions to the kids today in the children's sermon. So maybe now we need some adult suggestions. There are lots of lists on the internet let me give you a sample of some suggestions that you could find. Here are some ways to show love to your neighbors. Cook an extra casserole, give it to a neighbor. Invite your neighbors to dinner. Give small Christmas gifts to your neighbors. Be the person in the office that always listens and always asks questions. Buy an extra dozen donuts, give them to your neighbor. Check on an elderly person in your neighborhood and find out how they're doing. If you have a skill, let your neighbors know that, you, they can, that you'll help them and use it to help them out. Start a neighborhood Facebook group and engage with your neighbors in an ongoing way. Offer to babysit your neighbor's kids so they can have a date night out. Pray for your neighbors on a regular basis. We're just getting started, friends. This is obviously just a starter list. You could Google search ways to love your neighbor, ways to be missional, good deed ideas. You could come up with hundreds of ideas that would fit you. But you know what? You don't need hundreds of ideas. You just need one or two ideas that you actually do. So just do something. Remember, it's not good ideas that Peter suggests. It's good deeds that we actually accomplish. Pondering an idea is not a good idea. You've got to do it. Okay, I want to conclude with an experience I had a few years ago when I lived in Kentucky. I was part of a doctoral program for a year, and the group of us attended lots of churches to get ideas. One of the times we visited a vineyard church in Cincinnati. It was a large mega church. We were sitting there watching the being participating in the worship service. The guy that was sitting next to me was from part of the church. And so when the service was over, I was curious. I turned to my neighbor and I asked him, what brought you to the church? How did you end up getting here? I was expecting that he was going to say, well, I, I discovered the great music, or I heard the pastor preach a great sermon, or they had a super children's ministry or youth group. I was expecting there was something about the church uh, like that that had brought him there. His answer absolutely floored me. The reason I'm here is they kept giving me food. They kept giving me food. I asked him to explain what, was, what he meant. Well, a few years back, this guy was out of work and he was experiencing tough times. The church had a ministry where they would go into low-income neighborhoods and just leave a bag of groceries on every doorstep. They would do that every Saturday over and over and over again. This gentleman lived in one of those houses and they kept giving me food. And eventually I just had to go, come out and find out what kind of church does that. You see, it was a good deed that made the difference and won the day for that gentleman. Friends, maybe we ought to follow Peter's advice. Peter says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Let your neighbors see your good deeds. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you today for this exhortation. I thank you for this advice that Peter gave us. And Lord, yes, sometimes we get a bad rap. And 
we're not portrayed very well on TV and maybe our neighbors think differently of us, but we can change their minds and influence them if we're just people who are kind and loving and treat our neighbors with great love. Help us to do that. Help us to break out of our shell. Help us to come up with one or two ideas out of many ideas that we could choose to influence those around us. Lord, we want to be good deed doers, not to earn our salvation, but to show our neighbors who Jesus is. In his name we pray. Amen.